Good morning, my name is Reverend Douglas Morton. You are listening to chapel at the Institute of Lutheran Theology. We begin our chapel in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The message for today is taken from the book of Revelation, the seventh chapter, verses 13 through 17. We're told then one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these clothed in white robes and from where have they come? I said to him, sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe every tear away, every tear from their eyes. Dear loved ones in Jesus Christ, only those who are saints here on earth will be saints in heaven. Put it another way, only saints make it to heaven. Now that means that many of us are going to have to uh, look at that definition of the word saint and how we've used it in the past. For instance, if someone's caught doing something that's not quite so correct, uh, you'll often hear them say, hey, well, I'm no saint. And that's because most people have the idea that, you know, the word saint stands for someone who is exceptionally good in this life and well, very well behaved. Well, if that's the case, then very, very few people are ever going to make it into God's heavenly kingdom. And, and that's why their, you know, teachings have come up uh, to remedy that. One of them is the teaching of uh, purgatory. It simply says sin can't enter into heaven. So any sin that it hasn't been fully dealt with in this life, you know, must be dealt with at some point in the life to come. And so purgatory becomes, uh, for many people, a place where people go who are not quite yet ready for heaven. Well, the Lutheran Church uh, rejects this teaching of purgatory, not because uh, it seeks to be contentious. It rejects it uh, for several reasons. First, is you can find it nowhere in the Holy Scripture. But even more than that, we reject it because it goes against the glorious good gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. The gospel proclaims that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The gospel declares that God laid upon Jesus the iniquities, the sin, the wickedness of us all. The gospel states that you and I are justified. We are made right in God's eyes, approved by God, by his grace, as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The gospel is God's promise to you and to me that our sins truly are and forever forgiven in Jesus Christ. It's a glorious message and God sends people to us. He sends to us preachers uh, to hand over that gospel to us. And he sends the Holy Spirit to create in us faith in that glorious gospel. And thus it's through the gospel that you and I become saints right now, at this very moment in God's eyes. And so when it comes to places like purgatory or any other place, Martin Luther states that it simply conflicts with the chief article. And what is that chief article? He says only Christ and not human works are to help souls. So here is reality for us. Saints are made in this life. And they're made saints by God who forgives their sins and considers them to be righteous in Jesus Christ. You know, when Paul writes to the congregations uh, around Asia Minor uh, uh, in his letters, he often begins his letters by greeting them uh, with the word saint. I'll just give you three of them. Uh, Romans 1 verse 7. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 2. To the church of God that is in Corinth, 
to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those in every place, call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. And then there's Ephesians 1, 1, my favorite. To the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Paul is writing not to dead people here. He's writing to live people who are in these congregations. And many of these congregations were far from perfect. For instance, the congregation at Corinth, if you read Paul's two letters to them, you will find that it was extremely messed up. And yet Paul still calls these people saints, not because they were especially holy uh, by themselves, but because they were holy in Jesus Christ. It was Jesus Christ who made them saints by the shedding of his blood for them. It was Jesus Christ who forgave them all of their sins uh, through his death on the cross for them. And it was God the Father who handed over uh, that sainthood to you and to me and to those people there uh, in the proclamation of the gospel of sins forgiven in Jesus Christ. And that's the kind of saint that John sees in his vision in the book of Revelation. In verses 13 through 15 of chapter 7 of Revelation, he says, uh, Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes? And from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. Now notice this next phrase. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore... They are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. These people that John sees are clothed in white robes. And white stands for holiness and purity. Now, how in the world did these robes become white? Well, the angel simply says they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And this Lamb, we're told, is Jesus Christ. His blood is the blood that was shed at the cross to bring about the forgiveness of sins. A forgiveness that was not just for one or two or three people, but for the sin of the whole world. That's why John the Baptist, when he sees Jesus coming, can declare, behold the Lamb of God who takes away, here it comes, not the sins, but the sin of the world. In other words, in one big lump, Jesus took all the sins upon himself, the sin of the entire world, and took it away. And so the people in heaven whom the Apostle John sees, they're not there because of their own great holiness. They're not there even because they endured this great tribulation and came out of it. They are in heaven because they have been made saints. They were made holy and righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for them. Their sins have been forgiven forever. And all this comes through the shed blood of Jesus. In another place, the Apostle John declares, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, in verse 15 of our text in Revelation 7, there's a word, therefore, and it's very important. It comes right after the statement that these people had washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. <coughs> Excuse me. Therefore implies that it was this washing of the Lamb's blood that, came, that gave them the right to be in the very presence of God and to serve him forever. And so to be a saint in heaven means to be a saint on earth first. And to be a saint on earth has nothing to do with the good things that you and I have done, but rather with what God has done for you and me in Jesus Christ and what he does to us by washing away those sins. Now, the rest of our text is what it's going to be like to be a saint in heaven. If being a saint here on earth means that we're going to experience many tribulations uh, in this life, just as Jesus told us, uh, tribulations and temptations and so forth, then being a saint in heaven means all of these temptations and all of these tribulations are gone forever. To live on earth as a saint means to be in heaven as a saint 
enjoying God's presence and care for all eternity. Listen to verses 15 through 17 of Revelation 7. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. What is described here is something unknown to you and me, this side of eternity. We haven't experienced it yet. You and I, well, we're used to the problems that come with this life. However, the angel reminds John that there are no problems in the life to come. There are no physical problems. There are no emotional problems. There are no spiritual problems. I remember one time telling a young boy who had actually lost a, a one leg that in God's heavenly kingdom, he would have two legs. He was so overjoyed that that was good to come for him. All that causes tears will be gone forever. Protected by God the Father and guided by Jesus Christ, their Savior, means that nothing will ever harm us in this heavenly kingdom and joy will be ours forever. Psalm 16, verse 11, the psalmist declares, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. You see, to be in God's presence means a life full of joy. A life that you can't stuff any more joy into. If, I'm, if I would take a cup and fill it to the brim with water, how much more water could I put into it? No, no more. If I kept pouring water into it, it would simply overflow over the side. And that's what God's heavenly kingdom for saints is going to be like. And so one of the questions I'm often asked in confirm, by confirmation kids is, is heaven going to be boring? I mean, for all eternity, what are we going to do? My answer simply is absolutely not. It will not be boring. You cannot be bored when you are totally and fully and always full of joy. At God's right hand, we're told there are pleasures that last into eternity. What are those pleasures? I don't know all of them. I know being with Jesus is going to be an extremely pleasurable thing. But I don't know all that's going to take place, but I do know this, that I will enjoy everything forever and ever and ever. In another place, John says the following about being a saint in God's heavenly kingdom. This is in Revelation 21, verses 2 through 4. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. For the former things have passed away. It's important for you and I to remember that this heavenly kingdom is not someplace, you know, out there on some cloud. Rather, this heavenly kingdom is going to be lived in what the Bible calls a new heaven and a new earth. In 2 Peter 3, 13, we're told that according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. What a wonderful thing for us to look forward to. So saints begin here on earth as forgiven sinners in Jesus Christ. They're saints not because uh, they have made themselves more holy or better than other people. They are saints because they have God's forgiveness of all their sins through the blood of Jesus Christ shed for them. Now these saints know that they're not perfect. And because they still are sinners, the law of God accuses them. As a matter of fact, these people know that, you know, are drawn to, to go to God regularly and confess their sins to him, as well as confess their sins to one another. It's these people, these people who are saints, who look forward not to some place called purgatory, but rather to the fullness of God's heavenly kingdom. 
They can close their eyes in death, not in fear, but rather in full assurance that they will open them in glory all because of their Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, this Friday, November 1st, is All Saints Day. And for many people, whether they are Protestant, Catholic, or whatever, uh, they'll find that Sunday they will celebrate All Saints Sunday. We rejoice that God makes each of us saints through the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood which washes us clean from all of our sins and makes us righteous and holy in God's sight. This is yours and this is mine in Christ Jesus. You know, many of our fellow saints have died and they've gone before us. All of us know some. They wait for us on the other side. Through Christ, their robes and our robes are washed in the blood of the Lamb, and they are white. Therefore, we too who believe that glorious gospel promise shall be with those who have gone before us to be in God's joyful presence and care for the rest of eternity. You see, we are simply traveling through this life. The next life is our permanent residency. Dear loved ones in Jesus Christ, may knowing this and who you are in Jesus Christ change you now in how you think and how you go through this life. Amen. And now may God's peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise that you have made us saints through Jesus Christ, our Savior, and that you have prepared for us a glorious eternity with you, not because of what we have done, but rather because you have forgiven all of our sins and you have made us your children. We thank you, gracious God, that our loved ones who trusted in Christ in this life are, and have gone on are now with you. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that we can celebrate All Saints Day with joy and celebration because of all you have done for us and others because of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Hear us as we pray in his holy name, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.